One thing about select fish is you can eat 10,000 pounds of them and you'll never, ever, ever get a fishy taste, ever. Right. Now you can take a 16, 17 inch catfish and you can fillet 10 of them and eight of them will be, oh my God, but two of them you will spit back up. Don't ask me why, but they're, they'll be so fishy you can't eat them. But if you select them, you're, you're fine. All right, everybody, we are back for round two with Mike Valley, most interesting man on the Mississippi. We, we, uh, we're, when we left off, we were talking about uh, sheephead, red horse sucker, carp, uh, you know, utilizing a lot of these underutilized and, and really misunderstood species of fish. Mm-hmm. We just got done actually eating some buffalo, which are, I mean, that's a species of carp. Right. Yep. And similar. Yeah. As well as uh, snapping turtle. Oh yeah. First timer here, by the way. Delicious, Same, actually. And uh, we're going to talk about maybe what can be a another misunderstood fish. And we touched on this uh, uh, in the last podcast as well. We're going to get more into the tactics, though. We're going to yes. get into some tactics, some some sport hook and line tactics for uh, for catfish and right. and kind of the probably particularly uh, flathead. Channel cat, uh, the the differences between them, and 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 one reason why we chose catfish kind of as the uh, the centerpiece, I guess, of of this adventure with Mike over here on the Mississippi is, if you live in the United States, chances are you have catfish, you have access to catfish in in some body of water in your state. Yeah, the the gear required uh, to to catch catfish, you know, hook and line sport fishing. Uh, can be as simple as it gets. It's fun. It's relaxing. And and lest we forget, and I know we keep harping on it, they taste great. Yes. That's they sure do. Pretty much spot on. If they're cleaned right, they're incredible. Right. Right. So, Mike, without further ado, uh, how do we catch these damn things? Well, if you're if you're sport fishing, um, and and like I said, different parts of the country are different different tactics, different types, but, you know, southern states have four different kinds of catfish, basically. Up here, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, I think Nebraska, and that, we have basically two. We have the flathead, and we have the channel cat. So, two things to always remember, very important, is flathead only eats live things. It will not eat anything dead. So, uh, some of the baits for for flathead. Let's take flathead first. And another thing, let's get right off the top, right off the table. Everybody thinks that a catfish has stingers. It'll sting you. And like we went through out in the river there. Oh, yeah. A flathead cannot hurt you any way, shape, or form. It has little bitty baby uh, teeth inside of its mouth. So if you're noodling, you'll un- you, you, you've known that by when you pull your arm out, you get it all scraped to heck. But it's little fine needles like Thing. That's the only thing on a flathead. It, it, a flathead, a, a catfish has no stingers, anyways. Right. Perf- so let's get that out front. There's no toxin uh, there's no, or poison no, or no. Do people but just think their whiskers had it? In they something? think their whiskers are going to sting them. Well, they they don't. So a flathead cannot horn you. It cannot sting you. It can't harm you. But a channel cat has three horns that are deadly. They're barbed and they're razor sharp, and that's where the misperception comes in. So there's one on each side of the head and one on the top. And there's three horns. And they, they and they, you don't want to get poked by that. How, they, how, should, how should a person, uh, what's the proper way to hold a channel catfish then so you don't get So, so the or... proper way is to grab it. I always grab it with my left hand. Uh, so when I'm cleaning it, I grab it with my left hand around the head so that your thumb is around the, the so if it's facing you, your thumb is on the right side of the horn, mm-hmm. and your two, these two fingers are on in between the other horn, and the and the and the and the top horn will be right here in the crotch of your thumb and your finger, in okay. the front. So, so you got a solid grip on him, and you know the main thing is is when you've got him, hang on to him. Don't be let, don't be get scared and pull your hand back. That's when he's going to come around and nail you. So, yep, that's what a, I've been guilty a, of. A, a flat head, I usually on a bigger one, I will grab it under the gill. Okay. Is, is how sure. I grab it is under the gill. 
Um, if it's just a two, three, four pound fish, I just grab it the same way, right around the head. Um, but you know, but the channel cat will, and, and and they do have some kind of a, they do have some kind of a, I don't know if it ain't a, it ain't a poison, but if you get stung by one, it's gonna burn like heck. Oh, okay. It hurts so horrible. Well. Yeah, good it, to know. It, it's gonna burn. Okay. Yeah. And you can tell real quick too off the bat. So like flathead catfish, aka sometimes mud cat. Correct. They have this kind of slimy green color to them, right? And yep, brown. Then, Brownish, greenish, Brownish, blackish, green, yeah. And then um, your channel cats you're talking about, they're kind of like a bluish, grayish yep. color. Yep. Um, and so right off the bat, you know, you can kind of tell the difference there. If you've got a real big old brownish, greenish looking guy. Right. And then these, this like dark And a, blue, and a big gray. flat head. I mean, right. they're right. very distinctive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, so let's just, first of all, let's cover baits. So let's start with the flat head. So a little bluegill... Yeah, four or five inch bluegill is absolute uh, wonderful for a flathead. Okay. Uh, sheephead works good, but it, it will die easy on the hook. Hmm. Um, the number one, in, and from cleaning literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of catfish, uh, and cutting them open and seeing what's in their belly, um, it will either be, it will be one of three fish. It will be a bluegill, a sheephead, or a rock bass. And if you have a warmouth or rock bass in your area, that is your number one bait. That's, really? That is the, uh, 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 he cannot resist that. Now, occasionally there'll be a bullhead. And most people using bank poles, they, they prefer a bullhead because it does, it'll, it'll live indefinitely. It lives forever. And they love them. They like them. But... Uh, it, I mean, it, of all the fish I open up, if you open up 100, you might find a bullhead in one, but 75, you're going to find a rock bass or a bluegill versus two or maybe the other. Very, very rarely. You'll find a crappie now and then, but mm-hmm. not real often. Okay. Yeah. So bluegill, warm mouth, crappie, would, you know, and then a bullhead, I guess would be my, you know. And that's if you're going for flats, if right? If you're going for flats. And uh, crawdads, too. They love crawdads. Good to know. Um, a, a big crawdad. Yeah. Okay. So I, I got to, this is going to be a little bit of, you know, my inexperience in fishing showing, but when, when you're putting live bait out there like one of these fish, right, what kind of hook is that fish on? And are you just relying on the catfish to swallow the whole dang thing and you're going to pull it in? Well... Is what that? what are little so what what are I usually use a heavy sinker above a three way, and then I will I mean a quite heavy sinker, and then I'll use about a sixteen inch lead line, mm-hmm. okay. um, and then sometimes I'll use a circle hook. If I'm fishing with a bullhead, I will use a circle hook. If I'm fishing just a uh, like a bluegill or, or or rock bass, I'll use I like a, a number two. Stainless steel offset hook. Okay. That's what I use. Hmm. So you're you're actually you're you're you know your sinker sitting on the bottom and your fish is up and he's swimming up off the bottom. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and the main thing is 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 don't touch the pole. Okay. Cast it out, leave it sit, don't touch it. And then what he'll do is he'll come up and he'll grab it and he'll swim maybe 10, 15 feet, 20 feet, and he'll stop. And that's where everybody goes wrong. They set the hook immediately. All you're going to do is just pull it out of its mouth. Okay. Where versus a channel cat's totally different. So flathead, he's going to grab that fish. He's going to go run like he's going to run, and he's going to go someplace and hide, and then he's going to eat the fish. And then he'll turn the fish around in his mouth, and he'll swallow it. Give him 30 seconds, a minute maybe. And then when he takes off again, then set the hook. Uh-huh. See, it's a lot like a northern. We'll do the same thing. But, you know, everybody always, you know, and they, they, they get excited. They get excited, and you want to set that hook on him. You know, and nine times out of ten, if you're fishing live bait for flathead, that's what you've got is a flathead. You might get a northern or a walleye. You could, but probably not a channel. It's probably going to be a flathead. You know, That's exercising huh. quite a bit of patience. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. Can you do it, it Mark? I don't know, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a question. I can't so wait to watch you try. When you're uh, when you're hooking like a bluegill or something like that, 
where do you, where and how do you like to hook that fish? So, you know, A, it's going to swim properly. It's going to hopefully stay alive for a while. Uh, what, what's your technique on that? I usually hook mine about inch and a half, two inches above the tail, kind of almost in the middle of the, of, the, of the tail. A lot of people hook it way up high, right in back of the top fin. Right. Uh, I, I, there's, there, you use whatever you want. I have found that the fish swims better if he's hooked in the in this like almost the center of the tail. Okay, he gotcha. seems to swim better. Hmm. You know, and if I'm, I, you know, if you got ten or fifteen bluegills in there and he dies in fifteen twenty minutes, so what? Who cares? You know. So, but most people are fishing with three or four fish and they don't want to kill their bait, so they barely hook him. Okay. Well, if you've got him barely hooked, the, your bait barely hooked, you're you're going to lose baits. Sure. That's a problem because when sure. he because when he takes the fish and goes over and stops and turns it around his mouth, the hook comes out. Okay. So make sure you got it hooked decent. A lot of people even use two hooks, you know, one in back, one in front. But I, you know, I don't know. And so, you know. and then, and then this is a scenario where I guess you're going out and you're, you're catching your bait. Yeah. And yep. then, you know, maybe have it in, in a Most, live well or Mike a does everything DIY, or... so I'm surprised he didn't just make, <laughs> make the bluegill blue from yeah. scratch, just constructs a bluegill. Yeah, I knitted them. Most people, <laughs> most state, and check with your state laws, but most laws are if you catch, so if you go catch 25 bluegills, mm -hmm. that's your daily limit, whether or not you're using them for bait or not. And that's your limit, though. Mm -hmm. for, and then you can use them for bait in that state. I don't believe you can transport them state to state. So you need to catch them in the state you're in. And a lot of times it's even in the lake or the pond or whatever, you, or the river your system you're in. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, make sure you're at the rules and, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, I mean, boy, when it comes to fishing, you know, check check your local regs and that can be, yeah. depending on the body of water, it could change, you know, things can vary within your own state. So right. definitely look into that. But on mm -hmm. on. Where it's legal, it sounds like if you can get some some bluegills or rock bass, that's going to be your number that's, one for flat. That is, yeah, that's his, yeah, yeah. Like I said, and then like I said, you will get now and then. There's there's some copies, but you know if we're cleaning a, you know we get a, you know say in in the fall when we're you know cleaning thousands of pounds a day of flatheads. If there's you might have twenty five fish over fifteen pounds. And if they got something in them, we, I'll look just out of curiosity, yep. you know. And, and like I said, and a lot of times they'll have three, four great big bluegills or rock bass, or they might have a bluegill and a rock bass, you know. Well, a, man, it's even but, hard to sometimes just hold on to a bluegill, especially with their barbs on their back. I can't imagine just swallowing one. Swallowing, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you better you have like a you tough said, I guess digestive system. They're, they're turning that thing They're turning it, it around right at first, exactly. Oh, yeah, they're it. not swallowing it backwards. Smart. That's why they grab it and go run with it. And, yeah. Get, sure. Get yeah. things situated. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, you brought up just you mentioned fall when you're cleaning tons of catfish. I know we also just came off of a time in like early summer where I believe it was pretty hot for catfish. Can you describe? And I know it seems like you can fish for catfish quite a bit of the year, but it, there seems to be specific Periods. times where right. they're really hammering, right? Yeah. Now, flatheads, your number one, number one period, I would have to say, would be. September 15th until October 15th. Maybe October 20, 20s, in the 20s. But usually by Halloween, they're done feeding. <laughs> and But they feed up intensely from September 15th till October 15th. They feed up for winter. So they're going crazy. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're, they'll be just nuts. So I mean, that it's, is, it's that's your time for them flatheads. To, it's very courteous of them to shut down right before deer season really gets cranking. Yeah. That's nice, yeah. <laughs> And so, and then, and then, like now, channel, uh, like say when channel cat are spawning, they don't eat. They got one thing on their mind, and that's that. Mm -hmm. And where flatheads will feed a little bit during spawning season, but channel cat usually, as a rule, they don't they don't feed much. And then about a week after they come out of spawn, then they feed like crazy. So right now is really good channel cat. Okay, so this is again like early August or so, sometime yeah. in there. So right. yep. those yep. channels, when are they spawning then? Channels are spawning usually as a rule from first eh, June fifteenth till July fifteenth is normal. And That's, they're not eating during that time. They don't period. eat. They don't eat much. No, Man, the no males wonder. the males will eat a little bit, but the females usually don't eat much. No, 
But the flatheads, yeah. they'll... The flatheads will eat a little bit, but not... Fishing, cat fishing is not very good during the spawn. Yeah, it's just sport, not... Sport style, right? Sport style. Because then you're actually, commercially, your commercial fishing, it, you can use it to your advantage. Exactly. Interesting. Exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So so getting back to, like I said, that that's your prime. Usually as a rule... Like like I always I gauge use Halloween because it's, it's there every every year at the end of October. But usually, so if you're cleaning flatheads the first week in November, usually they're per, they don't got they got nothing in their stomach. It's you know it's they're 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 done. Okay. Mm. Yeah, they're fattened up and they're and they're done primarily eating. Channel cat will still feed clear up until ice. They'll they'll go into ice. I would have to say the best period for for channel cat for fishing pole line is. The best month would be August. The hotter, okay. the hotter, the better. Hmm. So that that would be my theory. Good thing we brought a couple rods today, Jim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then don't channel, say, don't channel say you cat, told me so. Um, you will catch it. You'll catch. I mean, there's a lot of channel cat eating bluegills and and other fish too, but primarily, um, you know, I, I've used everything. Excellent bait for channel cat is snapping turtle livers. Is snapping really good, livers. excellent bait. Did, um, did you just did you hear that from somebody? Was yeah, that like I think I read it in a book someplace down okay. years and years ago, and and it works. It really works. Uh, that's um, got to be one of those books though, because I've got a couple in my basement. Like they were written forever ago. Like they almost yeah. like they're like a historic <laughs> artifact yeah. w- where you yeah, find they, these little tidbits of nuggets. Yep. Like nobody has snapping turtle livers on hand, you know, just so yeah. laying just, around. <laughs> yeah, um, chicken liver is really good. Uh, tons of people around here use chicken liver. Um, chicken gizzards work really good too. Now we were uh, we were down memories. in Louisiana this spring. We were chicken fishing, gizzards. and we were using chicken gizzards marinated in cherry jello and garlic. And man, it worked. It, just, it really like, worked. It seems like the channel cats just go after like whatever is the yeah. most gross. I thing think you, you can could probably imagine. put anything on a hook, and and yeah. <laughs> Now, like I said, the, we used to use clam meat. So, so obviously, you don't have, you can't go down to the local clam buyer. And so, if you anywhere you're at, you've got clams. Make sure you're taking the right ones. But there's, you can still take. Uh, I think it's 25 pounds a day for bait. So, oh wow, uh, you've got what's called floater clams. So you'll be going along in a lake, and you'll see a great big clam floating. Those are floaters. Those are excellent catfish bait. So take that, cut it open. Uh, Cut, you can either cut it up beforehand or you can put it in a glass jar. And we'd put, um, so say if you had a gallon glass jar, say half full, uh, I would put a little bit, like a cup and a half of milk, like 2% milk. I would put uh, a half a cup of white sugar and a half a cup of salt. Oh, man. Stir that up real good, put the lid on it, and leave it set outside for a week. <laughs> And it, it will stink, but I'll tell you what, that is some of the best catfish bait. Uh, unbelievable. I'm imagining the smells Yeah, as you open that uh, up. Other baits, I mean, like now you go down the store and you get sunny, super sticky. Uh, there's cheese and there's a blood bait. Um, and, and then using the rubber corrugated worms. Most people, that's what they're using. Most people are going with the cheese. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know. Um, now, like I said, this this today I actually have three hundred pounds of ground fresh ground soybeans coming, regular soybeans. Uh, that's probably the number one universal catfish bait in the U.S. is soybeans. Now you wouldn't think of that, but it is. Huh. Um, is that what they're making? Kind of like those those commercial no nugget, bait yes. nugget things. Yes. Yeah. Yep. yep. And they're just soybeans full of stinky stuff. I guess. Well, I what I do is I've I've got. All my outdated cheese and any cheese that gets a mold goes into goes into a five gallon bucket. Lid DIY on it. stink. Yeah, and so I'll mix fifty percent ground soybean and fifty percent cheese, stir it up really good, and that's about as good as a bait as you can get. I mean, even that seems know. all like a bunch of loose stuff. Are you like hooking it on a hook somehow, or does no? It, the cheese it? is solid, and you put the soybean with it, it almost makes like a dough ball. Oh, okay. so it'll stick together. It's almost like peanut butter. Okay, you know? nice, but um. For Channel Cat, I mean, they they will almost eat. I think you could probably use anything. Now, uh, Saturday night, um, a friend of mine set out set lines, and he set out 200 hooks of set lines. Now, cut shad 
Gizzard Shad is one of the best baits there is. As soon as the ice goes out, up until about mid-April, third week in April, it's excellent. Now, he had some left in the freezer, and he used it. He never got a fish on it. Hmm. Never got a fish. But he did catch some wonderful fish on big cut minnows. Uh, the bigger walleye minnows cut into threes, and just a piece of that on a hook, and he did he did quite well on that. Hmm. So there's different, like, you know. Uh, now, later in the fall, like, say, let's say f- mid-October, uh, if they're fishing channel cat, we would switch to cheese, just cheese, no soybean. They'll quit eating soybean about third week in September, maybe first of October is pushing it. You know, they don't want soybean no more. You couldn't catch fish on it. But then if you got stinky cheese, they'll eat that the colder it gets. So it's really, it's you know, it's strange. That, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. What you, I just, um, my dad used to, when the packing plant was here in town, he would get blood from beef blood and put it on a cookie sheet about a quarter of an inch thick, let it dry out in the sun for a day for, you know, four or five hours. And then he'd cut that into like the size of a sugar cube. And that was an unbelievable bait. That was some of the best bait there was for catfish. And it, uh, How it'll are you stay on the hook. hook. It, it's, it'll stay on the hook. It, will, it'll, it gets hard. It gets, it'll, it'll get really hard. Uh, another one they used to use was ivory soap. <laughs> they would take Wait, it, Yeah, ivory dish soap, ivory bar soap. Um, they would cut it into chunks and drill it and just drill a hole through it so it's in, in, it caught tons of fish on it. I mean, literally, I think you, it, it, it would be mostly. interesting to try sometime, just try all these weird different yeah. things and just see what you, you know. Yeah, I, mean, I feel like at some point, at some point, you're just almost like it's a game. Yeah. Just let's see if this let's catches see if this, them. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really sounds like just the stinkier, the better, kind of somewhat, not arbitrary, but like a pretty wide array of smells that will work. And I'm just, trying to just imagine leaves what, like a big scent trail yeah. and plume of. I'm trying whatever. to imagine what walking around Prairie du Chien in the heyday of catfishing must have smelled <laughs> like. You got dried beef blood <laughs> over there at that guy's house, and you got a bunch of stinky cheese, and then like curdled milk, and you got <laughs> for, yeah. for sun sun fermented clams. Well, when they were when they yeah. were doing the clamming, it was man, it was it was pretty ripe <laughs> when they were cooking clams. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty ripe to imagine. say the least. Wow. It is fitting but, though that you can catch fish on cheese in Wisconsin, though. Yeah, that is that's fitting for sure. Yeah, and that the the kind of stinky nature of of what it is that you catch them with, I can imagine, would give would give some of these fish a little bit of their reputation, maybe right. for being kind of gross, right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I mean, you think about a catfish when you pull it out; it's kind of a weird looking fish, you know. Yep. If you if you're used to seeing other more traditional fish, I mean, I I'll be the first to admit. Before really actually concentrating on fish, which I have to say pretty much happened after we hung out with Mike for a few days. Now I'd like think fishing is super cool and like I'm really into it. But before it was kind of, you know, somebody would be like, oh, walleye, bass, you know, perch. It just, they'd throw out fish names and I just always kept Im- imagining like the same fish in my head. Like, yeah. it just you know, <laughs> looks kind of like that. You can draw it on a piece just of paper. Fish, yeah. But then when you see a catfish, you're like, whoa, that's from outer space. But yeah, you think you know, yeah, you know, bottom feeding stink bait, and and admittedly, like, there may they may not be the most regal of the fish <laughs> species, perhaps. But um, yeah, I think all those things probably do contribute to maybe their uh, their reputation at times with some. Yeah, of uh, being like, man, man. Yeah, where um where do you find uh, like somebody should look to go? You know, if you're if so you're, if you're so if you're in a smaller river, um, snags. If, if you've got a downed tree or a big snag pile, mm-hmm. um, most catfish, even the flathead, that's where they're going to be hanging out. On the upriver side, downriver uh, side? So you want to go above the snag pile. Okay. Above the above snag it, pile. Because your scent, so if that fish is hiding, they're laying in the snag oh, pile, sure. you want your scent to wash down so they'll smell your scent. I usually be 20, 30 feet above the snag pile. Okay. Very, very quietly. Um and That's the you only know, reason you got the stinky stuff. And is like, most people will say, uh, oh, "Oh, we fished that hole, we caught uh, three out of there, and then we had to move." Well, the reason, believe me, there's more than three down there because when you set a net there and you catch three hundred <laughs> there, they're there. The reason you have to move is because you've scared them, sure. you've spooked them. So 
it be extremely quiet. Catfish are extremely sensitive to vibration and sound. Mm -hmm. So the quieter you can be, if you're banging around the boat and slamming oars, slamming your dip net, you're going to catch one. Then you're going to have to leave. Gotcha. Yeah. So be extremely quiet. But but I always kind of, and now flatheads, rocks. They absolutely love rocks. Rip rap. Bigger the rocks, the better. Okay. So if you've got rocks, that's, and, and, and they love snags, deep. Flathead likes deep, way deeper. Channel cat, I mean, right now you can go fish channel cat in two, three feet of water. You'll mm-hmm. catch a channel cat. Okay. Um, so there's, you know, they're in, they're in different areas. And like I said, they don't hang together. Mm-hmm. They don't like one another. They don't hang together. I'm not saying you won't catch one bang and two seconds later, you'll catch a flathead that, you know, that, yeah, that's, that can happen very easily. Yeah. Flatheads and, are, and, flatheads are so classy. They remind me of, like, as we're describing where they live, what they eat, they're very small mouth bass. I, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, they're exactly. Yeah. Well, and it's like smallmouth. You don't, you know, smallmouth are in their own little category. Yeah. They hang, they like rocks. They like live stuff. So there again, largemouth, he'll, he'll eat primarily, he'll eat something dead. Doesn't bother them. Yeah. But they're hang different. Mm-hmm. They're in shallow. They're in, yeah. And you must go, you must go up above the snag a fair ways because if you're, just, if you're just throwing in your hook right on top of where they all are, wouldn't that kind of be like, you're going to spook them. Yeah. They'll yeah. all run yeah. and. Oh. And you want your scent to wash down. Sure. And a lot of times when, when uh, in a lot of, of the good cat fishermen, they'll take an onion sack or a little orange sack. You don't need a lot, the size of a softball. And they'll take some, and take some uh, cheese and some soybean or some chicken liver and put it in that bag with a little, I use a railroad spike or just a small weight and drop it right below your boat. Okay. And that okay. as... As as a you know a, a scent bag, like and a then, beacon, and then that'll pull them up out of this you know snag pile too, yeah, chumming you know so to speak. But sure, sure. Well, I imagine too you know that positioning, you, you know, once you hook a fish, you know they're not going to bring you right right in those snags right you know right when you lose it right yeah. And like I said, different areas are different, but you're gonna you you, you want to concentrate on snags. That's I mean that's where the fish. You know, yeah. that's where they are. Okay. I mean, you can go right out in the middle sometimes and catch, you know, if, if there is no snags, obviously they're going to be, they're somewhere. Right. You know. Right. So, and cat, and it, just about all catfish feed way better at night than they do uh, that, in the daytime. I was just going to yeah. ask about daytime okay. yeah. versus nighttime. Late night. What I have found for Channel Cat, my best fishing has been from six o'clock till dark. So say, say tonight. I I would leave at six and fish right up until maybe nine thirty, and there'll be that period of time about eight thirty to nine when it's just on fire, and then mm-hmm. when it's done, it's done. Wow. And and then you know, but then they'll start up feeding again, and it's same with the same with flatheads too. They 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 feed at night, so not saying you ain't gonna do good in the daytime. You can, um, yeah. But what uh, so then? Obviously, a lot of your fishing that you've done has been on the river. Yeah. But if somebody's in on like a lake, is it kind of the same thing? You're trying to do it more up close to the shore where there might be Right, but you got to understand a lake, you have no current. Yeah. So the chum bag is extremely important Hmm. in a lake because it it draws, because you have no current. You have, you know. Sure. So, and and, in a lake, if you have a depth finder, you want to fish drop offs. Okay. Obviously, or the deeper, the deeper holes. Yeah. Um, if you do have snags, that's they're going to be in a snag, you know. Okay. Interesting. So. Interesting. And I imagine you might be if you're bank fishing, you might be. Are you out of luck with the with putting that extra scent in the water, or can you do that there? Too, oh no, or? you can do it absolutely. You can do. I mean, a lot of a lot of people that I the good cat fishermen, they'll actually because so say you have a tipped over tree coming off the bank, the mm-hmm. tree is t- tipped over into the water, and it's still attached. The roots are still attached to the bank. Mm-hmm. Well, on the downside of that tree, there's going to be a what we call an eddy or sure. a whirlpool that's created, and that's where your fish are going to lay. Well, if you try to get in there with your boat and try to fish, you're going to spook him. So the good cat fisherman, he'll park down below there a half a block and walk up. And it's a, I mean, I, I, I can take you to, I could take you right now to, and you just guarantee, and the minute you drop in there, you got him. It's, I mean, it's, you know. But you're only you're right there. You're fishing in just three feet of water, whoop. right there. Yeah, yeah. 
Cool. Hope everybody enjoyed this couple minutes. We're going to go uh, catfish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, we're going now, right? Uh, yeah. This is the part where we end. No. Well, um, I imagine a situation like that, that's got to be pretty intense because you've got a, you know, possibly a sizable fish on a pretty short leash. Right. In, right. In a bunch well, of cover. And, 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 and 99% of people setting bank poles, you're within, you're literally within the bank because that's where the fish are feeding. Yeah. They're right up tight to the bank. You know, that is a, it's an interesting phenomenon about I'd say fishing in general. But you know, if you're on the bank, uh, you're you're casting out where the boats are, and if you're in the boat, you're casting to where the bank. Where guys the bank? Are. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing about the bank too, you can be a lot quieter. You're so much more quieter. Sure. You don't spook them right near as much. You know. Right. So. Yeah. Do you have to boat. watch your shadows at all? No, no, no. you don't. No, you're. That's they're not. They're not. You know, and usually it's it's not that clear, right? Anyways, and mm-hmm. so you, usually you're you're it's not like a trout, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. What? Uh, so when it comes to this is one thing that I uh, found myself being quite bad at. I was laughed at quite often by the crew here. That's all right. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, was like setting the hook, right? So like when oh, it comes yeah. to when it comes to you know on the catfish, like you brought up I mean, with the flathead waiting, you know. Yeah. And then when you set that hook, you know, it's just like that quick jerk of the of the rod or the or the fishing pole or yeah and is it the same way for like when when you feel you might have a channel cat on the line are you well usually the same when a channel cat it, well usually when he bites it'll be like if it's a small one it'll go tick tick tick, tick it'll be just a peck peck mm-hmm. peck okay. peck especially if you're fishing with a night crawler or worms it'll be a tap that's a little fish that's sure. a little fish if you get a, a, a three four five pound channel cat he he gonna hammer it he'll tear your rod right out of your boat. So that's, I mean, he'll literally, when he hits it, he hits it. Nice. There's, he's, and he's got it. You better set the hook now. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that's the, <laughs> that's one thing about it. I mean, a channel cat, he's eating it. That sounds exciting. Yeah. He's not grabbing it and turning it, you know. Well, and that, I mean, the, it, sometimes it sounds like in a situation like that, the, the hook set is almost even a little bit of a courtesy, you know, because he's, he's in it to win it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually I've actually watched uh, videos of underwater. Of, uh, uh, a channel cat is is a lot like a shark. He just goes crazy when he feeds. I mean, he just goes it's just nuts. They're maniacs when they feed. They attack and they go crazy. Uh, a flathead is a stalker. He's more real docile. Real. He'll he'll just he's stealth. Yeah. He'll sneak up, grab the prey. Done. He's not. You know, they're totally two different fish in that aspect of eating. Interesting. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty neat, actually. Yeah, yeah. Huh. And one other thing I wanted to mention, too, on bait is, and you can believe this or not, when I just got into an argument with a guy the other day, is night crawlers. And night crawlers are a good universal bait. I mean, that's the number one bait used of all baits. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You know. um, night crawlers versus red wigglers, let's say. Okay. Red worms. Red worms. I will take uh, three or four red worms and put them on a hook any day over a night crawler. Really? Yes, because you take you take and just just try this at home. Get a bucket of clean of get a get a one gallon bucket of water out of your sink. Take put three red worms on a hook and hold it in that bucket of water and look at it. It's constantly wiggling. It's just moving continuously. The worms. Yep. Put a night crawler on a hook and put it in a bucket of water. There's no movement. It ain't moving. Hmm. He might make he might wiggle a little bit, but nothing like. So okay, so that aspect now. Green night crawlers. <laughs> Don't ask me why, but I have had tremendous luck. It, they're called nitro. Yeah. Cra- yeah. I've had unbelievable luck with catfish on those green night crawlers. Don't ask me why. I don't know. But if I can get green night crawlers, I'll take green night crawlers. I've never tried yeah. those. But <laughs> so regular night crawlers, red wigglers, and then green and night then green, crawlers. Exactly. That's like your hierarchy from, yeah. from yeah. third to first. So when it comes to, in, in my opinion, really any fishing... There, there is something, or any fish or fishing fish species, there's something magical about the color chartreuse. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like a universal it fish is. love it color, and Dark, it's not what? a natural color. Uh, no. Can you? <laughs> I don't actually know what the color chartreuse is. I don't know. It's that? like kind of like Vibrant a, green. Yes. Oh. Yeah. It's like a tennis ball. I kind yeah. of it as yeah. like a pink purple, but okay. No. no. Good to know. Uh, the uh, like the top of that uh, mallard's head, or mallard's bill. head, or or, or, that, or his bot bottle there. Yep, the water yeah, that's, bottle that's top. More, Got it. That's chartreuse. That's the, chartreuse. The greenish part. The greenish the green part. part. Yeah. 
would be like a shark. Yeah. I call that zombie green. Yeah, there you go. So that's another. Yeah, that. So if you're familiar <laughs> with zombie green, but I mean, even ice fishing for bluegills, that's the number one bait sold. That's the number one jig color. Yep. I mean, walleyes, that's the number one color. Smallmouth, smallmouth, love, love it. I every, you know, yeah, interesting. And there's the color of the the nitro, night crawler. You know, it's um, it's close, but yeah, yeah I mean, it yeah. kind of falls along yeah. those uh, yeah. along those lines. But you know, and you think about. Um, well, I'm going off of a, a, an experience I had as, as a kid. We were actually up in these lily pads perch fishing and and uh, got hung up. And I had uh, like these sandals on that had like a uh, like a pretty aggressive tread to them. So we got out of the boat and the mud was just like disgusting. Like, yeah. I should have just broke it off. Got out of the boat, looked down in in the tread of my sandal packed with aquatic worms. Yeah. And I wonder if that's almost kind of like, uh, again, this is pure speculation going off a single a horrifying experience. <laughs> but uh, I wonder if they're like more made to be kind of like an aquatic type worm because they, they kind of looked similar to those, you know, like going off right. memory. This is a lot of years ago. But um, I wonder if that's why they moved a little bit more, a little more active. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. There it you go. Could, could be. It's quite a story, Mark. Deep thoughts. <laughs> a lot of questions here. We might leave more questions than answers. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. yeah. But uh, have you found you've also gone catfishing all over the country, pretty much, right? Have you found that it's? I, yeah, I've I've fished a lot in different different areas. Another bait I wanted to mention too uh, that we used to use. We have several of them, but grasshoppers are really good. No kidding. Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. And for for set lining and catalpa worms. If you've got a catalpa tree. Um, Right now, they're getting getting kind of pushing it for date on them. But like three weeks ago was up until now, mid-August is st- still. But if you've got a catalpa tree, the catalpa worms, they're just a little, look like a little white inchworm with, with green on They're They're unbelievable catfish bait. I got to be honest, heard of a catalpa tree. Yeah, yep. I, I got to be honest, Mike. I'm going to have to look and that then, up. Uh, Shad, is MC Ryan looking it up over there? Shad guts. Um, most people think, you know, uh, for a shad, a skipjack shad, mm-hmm. the guts for them are probably the the best bar none channel cat bait there is. But like I said, it's only good in the spring. It's okay in November when they, it's okay, but it's from yeah. the ice out up until about mid-April. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and cut shad too. And that's what we use for our hoop nets when we're fishing in the woods, when, when the water comes up in April. But they absolutely there's something about the oil in the shad that they just go nuts over it. That's cool. Yeah. Hmm. So that is a, if you get shad and and you can the, the the meat is good too, but the the guts is what they that's what they <laughs> they want. So what we do is we use a whole fish, obviously. Okay. But if you're going to if you're going to use it as a as a a, a catfish bait, fillet leave leave the skin on, fillet the shad out, and then cut it up in in sugar cube sized chunks. Take the guts out, mix it all together, put it in a baggie, and save it that way and use it that way. Oh, so the guts yeah. kind of the spread out spread over out the rest in, of the in the fish. rest of the fish. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. And that's I always cut it up and I freeze it immediately, vacuum seal it, and it doesn't hurt a thing. So cut it up into your bait size chunks and, and but put the guts with it. Yeah. Yep. Once you've uh, have you ever tried like uh, like you know once you fillet a catfish and get it all. Uh, you know, process parts of the the skeleton itself. What they need, like residual meat on it or anything like that. Uh, have you ever tried no, that? No, no, no. I haven't. I don't think it. I don't think it would work. I don't. I, I don't know. There's there's oil in it. There's you know, but I I just don't think it would. There's other baits that would be so much better. Yeah. Hmm. You know. Yeah. You know. And 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 we have. There's many times when I've I have found a flathead with a little channel cat in it. Many times. Mm-hmm. Okay. But I think he's eating it because he hates it. He hates the fish. <laughs> it's like a walleye eating a uh, a willow cat. You know? Okay. Okay. They, they hate him. They ain't eating it because he wants to eat it because he's hungry. He's eating it because he hates you. And I think that's what the flathead is doing to the channel cat. You know, I don't think he's actually eating it because he likes it. You know? <laughs> this, this isn't because I think you're delicious. It's because I hate you. I want you to know. <laughs> it's just strictly to remove yeah. you from my area. Yeah. 
That's funny. Yeah. I love the, uh, Mike, I, I, one thing I got to say, too, is I love the willingness on your part to share all this information, too. I think that's that's super cool, you know, and, and one of the things that you were talking about is your, like, how excited you are to tell other people, you know, about, some people get real secret, you know, oh, about yeah, a lot some of, of this stuff, and then, you know, very, I don't want to give yeah. away all the secrets and stuff like that, but. Yeah, no, I've always been more than willing to share information, and absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, I, that is, I mean. That's a rarity yeah, in the you, fishing yeah. world. It's a rarity, but you know, and you have so much work into all this. And then I, I have to imagine, you know, that like we talked about in the last one, to kind of see some of the stuff that you've grown up doing for so long, and like, and every th- every time you talk about, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you knit your own nets, all this stuff. It's just so mind blowing. But you know, like to see some of that fading away, you know, then when you have some people that are interested, it is it's pretty neat to see the excitement level of of bringing somebody along to do oh, that yeah. as well. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I think that's pretty cool. And, and especially, you know, when it comes to catfishing, because like you said, it's something that pretty much everybody in America can do. Right. Oh, absolutely. Somehow. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's a, like a low barrier to entry. Yeah. Awesome fish. They fight like crazy. Oh, they fight. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. A hell of a fight. What kind yeah. of, um, what kind of, uh, you know, like rod, rod and reel setup? Yeah. Reel setup. Would do you, would you, you need? You can use whatever. Um, if you're fishing flatheads, you want heavier test. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even consider fishing with less than thirty pound test on a flathead because if you get a fifty sixty pound flathead, you're you, you, you know if you got twelve fifteen pound you're gonna lose it. It's so, over. It's over. He gets in a snag, you're done. Um, channel cat twelve, you know I'll twelve fifteen pound test. You know I wouldn't use six. I wouldn't use eight. But I mean you can. But if you get a ten pounder, you're gonna lose him. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And. Uh, Hmm. Okay, well, that's good to know. You know, um, but j- open face or spin, it doesn't matter. I mean, as far as that goes. Yeah. Um, you know, I like mono when I'm fishing catfish versus spider wire or, you know, I like a good mono. Yeah. Um, you know, um, and like I said, the, the the lead line, if, you know, if, and I, I'm doing the same thing on, uh, as far as channel cat, as far as, you know, as far as the lead line, 16, you know, 16, 18 inches. 18, no more than that, no more, no less than 14, you know, on, on the lead line coming out, you know, but. Now, and you, and you said you're running a three-way swivel, right? So I guess, uh, like, are you running, are you running your lead off a dropper then? Some, yeah, a lot of times I'll run a, a well, a lot of times I'll put a, a slip sinker on my one, and then I'll put about a two-inch sinker on the other one, and then my 14, 16-inch line out. We so might, it's, so it's actually sitting on the, you know, your line's coming down like this and you think, and then your, your, your line's up here. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Because you want your bait up off the bottom, you, you know, and, and that's, if okay. you got current, that's going to happen. Now, if you're fishing, obviously, if you're fishing in a, a lot of times if I'm fishing in a lake or dead water, I'll use one of those little floating jigs. Okay. Chartreuse floating jig, like, uh, you know, with a green, green crawler or a, or a piece of a minnow head or whatever on that. Yep. Um, and and then to, to just to bring it up off the bottom. Yep. You know, because a lot of times you're gonna have weeds and stuff on the bottom, but you you know, it's gonna get lost. You know, so I yeah. know one thing I've I get, had success with for catfish and and non catfish species, and really that same um, same line of th- thinking is not a floating jig head per se, but like a little uh, chartreuse, like uh, you know, like a corky or really any bright color, and sometimes color doesn't even matter. It's just the fact that you're getting it off the bottom, but um, like a corky or a little float type thing, right? And then just yep. a regular hook down below, but it just slides on, slides on that leader right Slide, above the yes. hook. Yeah, yeah, that works. That works absolutely. So, I mean, there's a million different tactics. Um, yeah. Uh, now here in about two weeks, usually usually mid August, um, we'll go over here in the pit. Uh, where they're loading the barges, and they'll be loading corn and soybeans uh, in, in the barges there. Mm-hmm. And it is absolutely unbelievable. There'll be thousands and tens of thousands of catfish in there feeding on that corn and, and the soybeans. And we go, and there we're fishing with a one-eye. It's called, it's a lure. Okay. It's called a one-eye. One-eye shiner. Okay. And uh, you probably know what it is, don't you, Coop? Yeah. And, and we'll use uh, a quarter ounce. Uh, and and you cannot. It is just absolutely unbelievable. We'll catch forty. We'll catch a, 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 a one of the big giant igloo coolers yeah. full in two hours. 
two of us. Whew. It's unbelievable. It's just an absolute riot. That so that's but we'll a have some of them here? are. Yeah, <laughs> you come back. Get the new. Or they, they yes. you know, it's, it seems like mid-August till first of September is our is our best. And okay. in the evening, you know, six sure. till dark. But a lot of times, you know, there'll be four of us in my big boat. We'll all have four on one at one time. But it's Man. just it's just a riot. I'm canceling the but, bear hunt, Jim. I'm going catfishing. <laughs> you yes. know, there we're not using any bait. The, we're just I use so I like a silver one. A chartreuse is a good one, but quarter ounce, just little. And we're just jigging these off the bottom in about 25, 30 feet of water. But they're in there and they're eating the corn and the soybeans that are falling off the barge as they're loading the barge. So it's like a live pond in their feeding. You know, and it's just Goodness. a ball. It's do you, just a riot. Do you speculate that they're thinking that they're eating an injured, like they're just in there feeding well, that's why an I injured use, minnow? Or yeah, they, do they yeah. think it's a piece of soy coming off there? That's why I use silver because then they think it's, you know, they're thinking it's an injured minnow. Okay. Yeah, that's why I like silver. I have good luck. They got to be thinking like, man, we're getting all this corn and soy. Why don't I mix in a little protein, you know? The, <laughs> but they're just, all channel cat. I mean, you won't. We've I've, we've never caught a flathead. The flat, not, yeah, they're just never. not interested in it, huh? Nope. Well, they don't eat soybeans and corn. Oh, I mean, right, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I, I've never ever ever the, seen soybeans and corn in a flathead. Leave but. that for the peasant channel cats. They say. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> What up? We tip up our noses as former mud cats. <laughs> now we've become flatheads, and so we're fancy. There you go. What uh? What style of sinker? So we talked a little bit about egg sinkers, and then you know we're talking about moving water versus maybe still water. Do you have a preference well, in sinker always, style for either? Or I, I'm always more of a firm believer in slip egg sinkers. Okay, you know, but and my uh, I've seen more fish caught with more weight than less weight. When okay. fishing catfish, I'd much rather have, I'd much rather have more weight than less weight. Okay, you know, and and another thing that people do so when you're fishing flatheads, you're you're usually always fishing in snags or rocks. Mm -hmm. You're fishing in debris, and when that line hits the bottom, leave it. Do not touch it. Don't reel it in an inch. Get tight in your line, but leave it, because most people will start to drag it, drag it, drag it. They'll reel it in, and you within. Two feet, you're in a snag, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So that's no, that's key, you know. Leave it when it hits the bottom. Let it go. Don't touch the pole. Reel it. Tighten it up. You know, you tighten it up to your lines decently, but don't reel it. You know, and therefore that's why I like more more of a sinker, more weight on the bottom because it stays there. It's gonna stay there. Right. It's, it's not stay gonna stay there. It's not gonna be moving a... around and move into a snag. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because if if you're twenty feet ahead of a snag and there's a 15 pound flathead laying down in that snag and you got a live bluegill there it's going to take him about five minutes to get to it literally he'll be there he'll find you you don't need to find him interesting so, yeah man it's so it's so cool to think about what happens under the water you know it's like a whole other world down there and then you know you've got but i mean you, you think about what that flathead is doing and it's reminiscent sometimes of what like a a land predator does, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sneak it up on something, you know, they know it's there, they'll come to it, they'll sneak up on it, assess the situation, then when they feel right, boom. There was one time I was diving over, not to change the subject, but I was diving over here across from Lawler Park on a wing dam, and it was about eight feet of water, and I could see about three feet that day. Beautiful, beautiful, crystal calm day, and it was, it was just, and I could see, and it was, and, and there was a walleye about Oh, maybe an 18 inch walleye. And I was, I was kind of quiet, you know, I was, it was, cause it was so cool. Cause you could see that day and I'm looking around and he's, he faced me. He was about two feet from me and looking me and, and, and then he back off. I'd, I moved just a little bit and I'd scare him. Well, there was a big rock there. Well, I was wearing, I wear, I always wear these rubber gloves that you do dishes with the bright, you know, they're yellow, almost a chartreuse. Okay. And so I stuck my hand. I stuck my hand around that rock like this and just wiggle my finger like this, and he'd nail me. He'd attack. He'd come at. I'd have to actually pull my hand not to get bit, and then he'd back up. But it just it you was almost noodled so, the walleye. It was so neat to see <laughs> you know what they how they react in in the water. You yeah, know, it was cool. That is cool. That is you know I mean fishing in general right like you know I mean that that one of my favorite parts of it you know when we were going out there the other day or whatever. Um, is that visualization of what's going on underneath the water? What what is that? 
what can I tell, like, when that jig was hitting the bottom? Like, okay, yeah. what, what kind of bottom is it? Is, it, is right. it a hard bottom? Is it a soft bottom? You know, like, and then, you know, looking or visualizing, okay, so I'm pulling the rod this this much. So the jig's going this high off, and it's fluttering this far. And, and, and experimenting with those things, too, right. until you kind of were like, that's oh, yeah, the, I, I get bit when I do this, you know? That's a whole nother level, because... For so many people, you know, the water is just like all you see is the top of the water. It's just this mystery. Oh, ca- pond. cast it you out, just, wait, throw it in there. And <laughs> I don't know, maybe yeah. something will come. In. But when you actually understand what's happening underneath, that's like the that's like the next level, you know, to get to. I feel like one thing we'd be remiss to not at least mention briefly is you mentioned it earlier. The name is noodling. Some yeah. people noodle for catfish. Yep. And so you've have you d- you've done have that? you done that? No, you haven't. No, simply so, for the reason of this. You like your fingers. <laughs> you, yeah, yes. I've spent enough time. I've I've caught literally thousands and thousands and thousands of snapping turtles. And I know where they lay, and I know where they hide, and I am not going to stick my hand. So I've, I, don't need a, I don't need any more catfish. I'm good there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I have got bitten twice by snapping turtles under the water. So don't tell me they don't bite under the water because... I can verify they do. Okay. So that would that was you know that'd be just my biggest fear is getting bit by a big snapping turtle. Is, and are they in pretty oh, much kind of the same? They're places in the same that... exact yes, the snaggy. You know, it, it, you know when you're when you're noodling down Nebraska and Oklahoma and Texas and them, you know the rivers. You know they're you can stand up in them. They're not most of them are knee deep or waist deep or whatever. But here it's I mean they're deep. Yeah. You know yeah. you ain't you know they're too deep. But even down there, I did have the opportunity many times to do it. And I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> there's, no, there's snakes. I hate snakes. And I know, you know, I'm, I just got done trapping 30 snapping turtles out of here last night. No, I'm not going to stick my hand under that bank, you know. <laughs> yeah, that, okay, that's a fair point. That's Makes sense point. to me. Yeah. 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 It's something, every time I look at it, it's something that I think to myself, like, man, that looks like, it looks fun, it looks exciting, it looks cool. It's kind of crazy to think of catching the whole thing just on your arm there, wiggling around some big old catfish. But there is that element of just like, you know what, like, I think I was meant to be up here, you know, on top of the water for a pretty good reason. Yeah. You know, and yeah. There's gonna, just a I'm lot gonna... of stuff down there that I'm not meant to, I don't know. I'm not going to say I won't do it, because I could probably <laughs> get talked into it. <laughs> right. But I th- for right now, I think I want to use technology to my advantage. Yeah. I got <laughs> nets. I'll stick with them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did we want to cover anything on the the cleaning? Oh my gosh, yes, that was where that we were going to head next. Yeah. Bam, we are all because, on the same okay, wavelength. So let's say you got one now. Now you're bringing it back, and this is this is like so cool to watch you do when we were here, and and, and all this stuff too. We did, you know, Cooper here, uh, video guy, got all all this stuff on video when we were here with Mike. So you definitely want to check that out. Um, but yeah, Mike, go through the process because this is a big part of why some people think catfish has, you know, this bad rap. Right. Right. Is right. they just clean it wrong. Right. Number one, when you catch it, when you, you know, if you're going fishing, take a cooler full of ice. That's number one. Do not put water on your fish. Don't okay. keep your fish in the water on a stringer. They're going to die. And when they die and they're in their water, within an hour, they're going to be spoiled. So put your fish in a cooler full of ice if you can. I don't believe in live wells and boats. If you do have a live well in the boat and you want to run it, put a bag of ice in the live well. Right. I guess that's, <laughs> right. a, a, that's, safeguard that's a safeguard. That's a safeguard. Yeah. Exactly. So second thought, when you get home, clean your fish. Don't put them in. Don't leave them laying in the cooler until tomorrow or the next day. You clean your fish the same day you catch them. Hugely important. Mm-hmm. So on catfish, like I said, you, you take it your left hand, because I'm right-handed, and you wring them. So you're cutting on from the top of the head down to the... Where the horn comes out on the side, there's there's a little, horn, you know, the horn on the channel cat comes out or on the flathead, cut down to that at an angle, just mm-hmm. through the skin, so you break the skin, and then you skin it. You know, we have a hook on, uh, a hook on a table is what we got. Oh, yeah, you got a big, it, very it, sharp hook. Very sharp hook. Just stab them up through the chin yep. and... Through that bottom jaw, kind of yep. that soft spot. Through the, through yep. The, yep, through and the bottom they... jaw, and you skin them with a pair of catfish pinchers, catfish pliers, pinchers, whatever you want to call them. Um, you have to have them. A regular pair of pliers will work, but it's not very good. You're so good, you can do it I, in three passes. I yeah, and I skin all mine first. I don't. A lot of people don't even skin them; they just fillet them out, and that's fine too. Whatever. But the main thing is is to get them cleaned immediately, and then, so say if you so let's let's take channel cat first. 
So if you've got a channel cat that's 12 to 17 inches, 16 inches, let's go 16, 12 to 16 inches long, live, leave it whole. Leave it whole. It's absolutely to die for, fried whole. To, to my, in my book. With the skin on and everything? No, no, no. You skin it. Okay, you clean right, it. Right. You clean it. And okay. what we call, what I call the belly pad, uh, cut that off, that fry separate. And then each side of the fish, cut down to the bone about six slits on each side of the fish. So like, like two inches. Like big scoring. Yeah. yeah of, right? Yeah. But there's no bones in the in a catfish. There's, right. It's a skeleton bone. But I'm. This is for universe for for frying for getting it done quicker and and faster on each side. So that's on that's on a twelve to sixteen inch. So if he's seventeen inches to to twenty inches on a channel cat, um, you can stake it, um, you can fillet it, and it's still it's still decent. If you got a eight to ten pound fifteen pound channel cat. You've got to select it, and by selecting, I mean fillet it. So, which I'm skinning it first, filleting it. I cut it up in about three or four chunks, and then you've got the center mud line. So, go from that, go down, go straight down, and then leave. So, so you're leaving the skin on and all the red meat on the table. So, what you're doing is you're essentially just cutting out the white meat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So no red meat, no fat on what you're saving. Yeah. And then cut it up into bite-sized chunks. And then we'll talk about the marinade here in a second. But that's very important. And you can do that with a two or three pound fish as well. And it will be absolutely to die for. One thing about select fish is you can eat 10,000 pounds of them and you'll never, ever, ever get a fishy taste ever. Right. Now you can take a 16, 17 inch catfish and you can fillet 10 of them, and eight of them will be, oh, my God, but two of them you will spit back out. Don't ask me why, but they're, they'll be so fishy you can't eat them. But if you select them, you're, you're fine. Right. That was, the one, that was the one thing that I found so interesting is, is even, even a relatively not huge catfish is a, still a pretty big fish. Right. And when we did the select process, which, again, check that out in the video, um, but when we did the select process, I remember thinking to myself, like, these are some big old fish. Like, we're going to get some big old fillets off of them. But actually, when you select them and you start taking out, you get out the mud line, you get out the red looking meat, right. the fat, you end up with just some, like, just a few. Almost a scallop, like a scallop. Yeah. yeah. Little, yeah, scallop sized nuggets. And I remember yeah. thinking yeah. to myself, like, this is what we got out of that catfish. And it ended up being amazing and totally worth it when we fried them up and ate them. But it is it is kind of crazy when you when you get out all the well the and that's, stuff you see, don't want in that's there. That's the problem. And then and that's a problem why they got a bad name. You know, and what I do, I get people over and, and, and after I'm done selecting it and you got all that red meat in the skin and the fat laying there, and the people go, Well look at what you've all wasted. Look at how much you've wasted. I go, I'll tell you what we'll do then. I'll fry that for you. I'll eat this and well, I ain't eating that. Well, you <laughs> right. then it's not waste, is it? Right. Yeah, you know, so uh, that's the concept. See, they don't. If you're not going to take the time to do it right and clean it right, then don't waste your time doing it at all. Because well, you said you said if the, if you ate that red meat or the fat by itself, I oh, mean, you, you can't even like hold no, it you, in your mouth. No, you couldn't even hold. it And in the your only mouth. reason it would ever even be palatable in the first place is if it's mixed in it's with mi- the good exactly. meat, and then that's how some people eat catfish and they think to themselves like eh, it's okay eh, but it's yeah yeah, yeah. like yeah. they don't necessarily spit it out but it's also like i don't know if i'll have that again it's just because some of right. that crap was mixed in there right and when you do selects i mean it is and and, and it's the same thing with flatheads it's the same thing um they, they, they're not like i said a one pound flathead and a 50 pound are the same as far as quality consistency in the meat where a channel cat, a one pounder and a ten pounder are totally different. A ten pounder is going to be greasy. It's going to be fatty. It's going to be versus you know. So it's much more important to select the channel cat to me than it is flathead. But I select everything. If I'm having a fish fry, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But when we were doing our fish fries here on Friday nights, we'd have a hundred, hundred and fifty people, and we'd have literally ten to fifteen people go, "Okay, come on, spill the, what? What is this? This is not catfish. It can't be. This is unbelievable. What is it? Mm-hmm. That's catfish cleaned right. It's you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, when you, when you know, and and I think particularly as we're describing the process, it's like, oh, it does sound like that's kind of wasteful, but 
to exactly what you pointed out, if the end product is something that you're essentially going to huck in the garbage at the end of the day anyway, right? What's then, so why would exactly right. what'd you save? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then you're also doing the cheeks, which yes. are almost like they were, they were reminiscent to me of like the tenderloin in a deer. It's like catfish candy. It is yeah. because you get you only get two little ones out of each catfish, right? And unless you, it's a bigger, I mean, a big. If you get a 15, yeah, you, 20 pound flathead, you're going to get some nice cheeks. Yeah. But yeah. still, you only get two of them. Right. And and you better make them count because, dang, they're good. They are excellent. They're the best part of the fish. Well, and if you, yeah. get, a, you get a mess of cats. Right. I mean, yeah. that adds... I mean, I'd say even on even on some of the smaller ones, I mean, it's almost the size of a bluegill fillet. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. Is kinda, oh, yeah. it is kind of weird when you dish that cheek out of its head, you know, each one, and then you kind of usually ended up taking the eye with it. Yeah. And then you well, that like, gives you something to hold on. And then to. you're holding on to the eyeball <laughs> to get the meat <laughs> off the skin. That was kind of that was kind of interesting. Yeah. I wasn't expecting to be kind of like, hey, little buddy, here's your eyeball. Let me grab that to get your meat off. Well, I actually I actually one. This has been, and I don't know why I quit, but but twenty years ago, I was selling a lot of fish to the Asian markets, and and I took a baby food jar and I did six eyeballs pickled. I pickled the eyeballs out of the catfish and, and I put them in and I sold every one of them. They just went nuts over them. I don't know why I quit doing it. It's a pain. It's more of a, you know, mm-hmm. I don't have time to do it, but they just thought that was just, oh my gosh. You know? Interesting. <laughs> but, Probably so delish. there ain't anything, of you know, but it's like the cheeks. When I was a kid growing, you know, when we never saved the cheeks. No. Never. We didn't, we didn't save no cheeks. You wouldn't even, I mean, threw them all away. You know, it's, it's just, it's just uh, eating anything of the know. face and is now just we kind get, of been taboo for a long time. <laughs> well, now we get ten dollars a pound for the cheeks. You know, well, it's you know, if you get if you're cleaning a thousand pounds of fish, it's you know, that's pay for your gas, pays for your, a lot of things, and you it's know. delicious. Yeah, and it's, it's oh, like the best part it, of the it is, it is the best part, absolutely the best part. Yeah, absolutely. So back to cleaning, um, and then into you, your you, marinade you know, too. So when you've got your fish cleaned after you've cleaned them, rinse them really good in cold water. And you know they're all they're, when, when and there again when I was a kid everybody you soaked your fish in salt water after you're done cleaning them that's not to me that's not necess- it's a myth it's not it's okay it'll work it's fine it does stiffen them up but sure two to three rinses in ice cold water to me is viable and so and you're the, doing that in like a, a bowl or a bucket not necessarily like a colander it, no, or something like no. that and then uh, just I, I I've got sinks so I've got I've got two ice cold uh, sinks full of cold water. No ice, but just cold, cold water. Mm-hmm. They go into one, super rinse, super good, into the next, rinse, super good, and then from there into a colander to let the water drain, and you're good to go. Okay. You gotcha. know, that's, it's hugely important to, to get them that chill down, that, you know, that yeah. chill down. And so, and then uh, I always, all the fish we do, even the fish you ate today, uh, soaked in beer. I take, it doesn't matter what kind I of beer, argue cheap, with that. cheap, cheap beer, uh, I'll add a little bit of uh, sweet basil, a little rosemary, a little garlic, a little lemon pepper, a little pepper, whatever you want. Uh, an hour is is sufficient. Two hours is better in the fridge, in a cooler, whatever. But take them right out of that. Uh, if you want to put a little seasoned salt or a little bit of salt in with it, don't oversalt it because it's you know you can get fish salty real quick. Um, but an hour in, in some beer is great. Take them out of that. Uh, drain them a little bit. Uh, bread them. Fry them. So, and I always tell people the most important, two most important steps in frying fish is number one, never ever pre-bread more than one minute ahead. So, <laughs> if you've got yeah, a I party, almost, you're uh, having a party, and I you got a bunch of <laughs> a bunch of guys Jim. that want to help you bread, you know that's so never pre-bread more than a minute. And, and why is that? If it's if it's really super cold out, you could go five minutes. But when it's hot and humidity. They'll collect humidity almost immediately in the flour, and if 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 you've pre-breaded, you'll and, and you and you see your fish turning almost wet looking mm-hmm. and opaque, they're, they're wrecked. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, because that stuff just when you try to fry something with like a uh, just when the batter is all wet like wet. that, yeah. it doesn't make a nice consistent crust around the and, actual and it falls stuff off you're frying. It the flies fish. off. Ex- it fry, yeah, exactly. falls off too easily. Yep. And then you also get a lot of cracks usually in your yep. batter. And yeah. Yep. And so that's that's hugely important. And the other one is is make sure when you drop the fish in, it's sizzling. 
Yeah. Um, another another th- thing that people do, I when I'm if I'm frying a thousand pounds of fish, I drop one in at a time, one nugget at a time. If you take a handful of nuggets and throw them in the deep fryer, you're going to get a handful of nuggets back out and crusted together. Mm. You know, and that's a. To, I mean, they're just little tips, yeah. little things. Well, and but also that works good for me though, because then I'd be like, I'll take that one, <laughs> that but I get all of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then also, like every time you put something in there, you're cooling down the temperature of the oil too. Correct. So then you always have to kind of be mindful of that it's like when you're cooking on the grill and you flip steaks or something, the spot that the steak was just on is now colder exactly. than the rest of the grill. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm you know, I'm a firm believer in peanut oil. If you're allergic to peanut oil, whatever, but I that's a different story. But um I like peanut oil. Um I, and I'm frying at about four hundred, four and a quarter. I'm frying hot. I was just saying that's hot. hot. Half the time in the oil. Most people are doing 350. Right. Yeah. But I mean, that's, it's, I mean, that extra 50 degrees, you can get by with peanut oil because it doesn't burn as easy. And it's half, literally half the time in the oil. So Mm -hmm. it just, it does make a difference. And you were talking like, you know, a lot of folks say like, when it floats, it's done. Right. But you like to let it go go maybe a little bit longer. 15, 20 seconds at least. I would, I would much rather have, there again with the weight on the pole, I would I would much rather have the fish a little more done than not done because mm-hmm. there's nothing worse biting into a piece of fish and it's half raw in the middle. Yeah, it's no good. Yeah. I, but, I, f- I feel like it was yeah. coming out kind of a little bit more of a more of a amber color versus like a, maybe like a lighter time so like a color or like a yeah instead of coming out looking like Bud Light, it comes out looking a little bit more like a Alaskan amber. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. Good qualification. Yeah. But but no, you, you can but you, but you can marinate it in either right. You can marinate it in either. We're just referring simply to color when it's done. And but they yeah. and they do float when they get when they're getting really close to done, especially the the slacks. Mm-hmm. Um, and well, any of them, they're that's going to float mm-hmm. to the surface. I mean, but I'm I, I fifteen seconds over what you think is when you think it's done, fifteen seconds, mm-hmm. and it ain't that ain't that long. Yeah. And then um, a couple other great tips is is so when you take. When you think that 15 seconds, when you're thinking ahead, turn your oil right down to almost nothing to where your gas is still on, but barely. Because if you take those fish out and your oil is sitting oh, empty for sure. three seconds, it's gonna heat you're going to burn it. Really You're going to burn it. There's nothing in it. Now you're at 450. Bang, you burn your oil. You're done. It's all over. So at that 15 point second, when you think it's turn your oil right down to almost nothing, that gives you time to get your fish out, get them drained. And put your other fish back in, then turn your oil back up, and you'll be good to go. Uh, another thing is, is I always put six or eight layers of paper towels in my pan, and I'm draining my fish in the pan as much as I possibly can. Mm-hmm. In you know, rather than a scoop, dump, scoop, dump. Because if it stays really oily, then it gets soggy. It's soggy. It's no good. Drain, yeah. drain, drain is huge. Make sure you put paper towels in the bottom of a. Yeah, of a, of whatever the container you're putting them in. The and, first once you know. I finally did that, I remember trying to make homemade French fries, like deep fried French fries. <laughs> the first time I did that, I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is how they get crispy." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were always soggy before. Yeah. yeah, there's a million different things we could go over, but I think as a whole, we've covered enough to get somebody to where, hey, this is this is mm-hmm. this is going to work. And if you're curious, too, like we said in that video, a mm-hmm. lot of this stuff was done. So, you know, we'll, you'll be seeing a lot of how that was going on. But uh, it what and, and man, I got to say, the end result was yeah, amazing. I, we could have just kept eating it. The flathead, as far as as far as fillets or slacks, if you want a fillet, it, it, it doesn't matter in size on that. I mean, if you want to do a whole fillet, I mean, use a there again, a. 14, 15, 16 inch fish for a whole fillet. Um, that's fine. Um, but most of our flatheads we do select mm-hmm. select yeah. out. You know, and they do have a lot of red meat on the backside. They're gonna have you know a lot of red meat. Um, that's gotta come off. The same thing. But man, and keeping a sharp knife super sharp, important too. Sharp knife is huge. <laughs> you were sharpening Absolutely. your knife almost constantly yep. while we were going through it because yep. other, you know, it's it's it does end up being kind of precise. You have to be because you don't want to waste the good part of the catfish no. because there's when you get rid of a lot of it you know you realize that you are still left with a good bit but you don't want to waste that because it's really well, good stuff and there's, then there's just thin little layers yeah. you got to make your way through and there's and, some people that I have I've had work for me and you know if you're cleaning if you're cleaning a thousand pounds of catfish a day and you waste a little here and a little there 
at the end of the at at the end at you know at the end result is you've wasted fifty pounds of fillets where that I wouldn't have. Right. So fifty times eight is four hundred dollars that you've just wasted in one day. That's a lot. And and it's when you put it that way, you know, yep. yeah, you know. So it's and like I said, when you're selecting, if you get 90 percent, you're good. I mean, you don't need a hundred percent, but ninety percent is is good. I mean, you can leave a little red meat, and a, you know, a little bit on there is fine, but it will make such a world of difference that you can't even. I mean, it's it is unbelievable the difference. Uh, that you will you will find that that will make in your fish fry when you're frying the catfish. It will just be unbelievable. Mm-hmm. So, and we're also gonna have to uh, Mike so kindly is uh, offering up his recipe of his fry for breading. the breading. Yep. Yes, and, some and good the, tartar sauce and the tartar yeah. sauce. Yep. Speaking of sharing secrets, I mean, and I mean, this seriously. is something. This is for sale in Mike's shop. Yes, and he'll but he's sharing the recipe with us, which is awesome. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, Mike, though it's it's super awesome, and again, we said it in the last one. I but got, we'll say it. I got one more question. In this one too, I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna throw this out though. If you are ever in the Prairie du Chien area, southwestern Wisconsin, between Iowa and Wisconsin, go by Mike's shop, Valley Fish and Cheese. But and okay, we're, one, we're open seven days a week. Uh, we are closed January and February, um, but we're open seven days a week, um, Monday through Friday or Friday and Saturday is uh, nine to six. And regular hours, 9 to 5. But if we're here, a lot of times we're here later than that, we'll, we'll gladly wait on you. Nice. So Awesome. It is it is unequivocally worth the stop to pick up some fish, to pick up some cheese. To sightsee. To, to, it's like a <laughs> yeah, museum. It's a be- beautiful area. It is area. like a museum. It's like a museum in there. If you, if you I mean, and I mean... Souvenir rich. I'm not trying to sell souvenirs, but if yeah. I was if I was a kid <laughs> and I came to Mike's shop, number one, my parents would be uh, pulling me out of there after probably about two hours of looking around. Yes, <laughs> and I would have asked for about a uh, hundred different things. Right. <laughs> so, what was your one yeah. more question? My one question is, is I'm, I feel like we built this up. So, what's the biggest catfish you've tangled with? The biggest catfish. That's great. You asked that because. Um, I'll get to the turtle thing in a minute. (laughs) The biggest catfish that I've ever caught in a net was 96 pounds. And there was two of them in one net just above Wailusing Beach, and they both weighed 96 pounds each, flatheads. And I was 16 years old. It was with my dad. And, uh, yeah, so that's the biggest catfish. That is so now. Big. Another thing is is so uh, the diving. I got like over ten thousand hours grader. on the bottom of the river. You can't see your hand in front of your face, and I'll hear it five hundred times a year. Oh, there's catfish down there below the dam. They say that's, that's as big as a truck. Well, how would they know that? Because you can't see. There's you know, right. <laughs> number one, you can't see, and number two, there's never been one documented. That's the biggest catfish that I've ever down south. I have heard of some hundred and fifteen, one eighteen, one nineteen. But I mean, no, there's no catfish as big as a truck. Uh, snapping turtle is another thing. Is oh my god, this snapping turtle! It's it's, it's you got to come to my pond and get this snapping turtle. It's 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 bigger. It won't fit in a wash tub. It won't fit in a fifty. It's huge. Well, you go get the turtle, and it's a nice turtle. It's a 40, 45 pound turtle. But and and they're like, oh, that ain't him. That ain't him. <laughs> oh, that's not him. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. Trust me, Godzilla is down there. <laughs> Man, snapping turtles. But the biggest Ooh. snapping turtle that. I ever caught personally myself was 56 pounds. Um, a friend of mine was with me. He caught a 67, and the biggest one my dad ever caught was 78. That's so as big as like a golden retriever. 78 is unbelievably huge. That's that's a big turtle for a snapping turtle. Now alligator snapping turtles they get up to 200. Pounds, you know. Can you okay, imagine gotcha. if you got bit by one of them things? Oh, you wouldn't. No, it wouldn't be good. <laughs> You'd lose a limb. Whatever it bit, it would be gone. Yeah, not good. <laughs> Nobody likes that. What? Yeah. Do you know how old a turtle like that? Like a fifty-pound turtle. How 50, old is that? Fifty turtle? years, pound a year. You can usually figure. So, wow. Yeah. No yep. kidding. Yep. Depending on where they're living or what you know, but here, roughly, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Well, so, they're delicious. The they one, sure they are. are delicious. I, uh, Holy crap! The ones I we just ate were amazing. I heard one time, and I heard this, and, and like I said, up until today, I've never eaten any snapping turtle. And actually, I'm not sure if I've ever even met somebody that's eaten snapping turtle. <laughs> All I know is I've been told, you know, there's seven kinds of meat in a snapping yep. turtle. I've heard it 500,000 times. Is and I that want, true? Well, I want you to do something. You name me seven different kinds of meat. Go ahead, start. I'll, I'll count them. Name them. Start. 
Wait, seven light, different kinds of meat. Seven meat, different kinds of meat. Dark meat. No. <laughs> like what, Beef, like, oh, pork, oh. chicken. So there's three. Fish. Fish. Four. Ish. Venison. <laughs> Five. I, I'm out. See, that's a problem. <laughs> there's three. There is three. There's When you clean a turtle, there's three distinct different colors. I mean, it's blank, blank, blank. There, there is three. Okay. And they do taste... Uh, the the white meat is is reminds me of chicken. It's very mild. Mm-hmm. Um, now what you ate today was white and and some red. There was yeah, no real dark meat in there. Yeah, I but if one you notice like when you were when you were color. eating it, yeah, did you? If you yeah, that's. But if you notice when you're eating it, some of it's real soft, and some of it was real chewy. Okay, the hmm. chewier the chewier one is the red. Okay, yeah, it's much more chewier. But there is three, and I would say chicken, beef, and pork maybe. But it's not fishy. At all. It's not fishy no. tasting. No. Um, it has its own unique flavor. Now, if you're eating it, like I said, baked with our baked recipe, then you really get the, you can, then it really comes mm. out as, you know, the flavors as beef and some pork and chicken, you know, can taste it that way. What parts but, of the snapping turtle, I mean, I've seen the legs, I'm going, I've never cleaned a snapping turtle. Like the legs seem kind of meaty. Where's, where are you getting the meat from? The neck uh, has, the, has the, the, the best meat. Okay. And the neck. And then the front legs are really, really super good. Back legs are all dark meat. Tail's all dark meat. The butt's all dark meat. And then the center loin that's attached to the shell that goes okay. down the middle of the back, that's the best. That's the tenderloin. That's all pure white meat. And that's the absolute best. But, um, yeah. And, and, and another thing is, is so you'll get about a th- little over a third. So if you've got a 30-pound snapping turtle, you'll get about 9 to 10 Pounds of meat, depending on who's cleaning it. Okay. Okay. You know. Gotcha. So that's about what you'll get. What you know, that's about what you'll get. Now, uh, as as far as biting underwater, yes, they will bite you underwater. Trust me. <laughs> we believe you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, on the on the hottest day of the year, so say if it's 105, you set a rattlesnake down and you set a snapping turtle down, and a snapping turtle will be faster than the rattlesnake at striking. He is so fast that you can't even imagine how fast he is. And his head, his neck is 12 to 14 inches long. It's a hell of a lot longer than you think. And he can <laughs> he, he can nail you so quick that you just, when it's hot. And they'll yeah. bite you when it's cold, too. But, I mean, when That's, it's hot, it is uncanning how fast they are. Absolutely yeah. frightening. I yeah. still remember the time that I picked up a snapping turtle. I was driving down the road, thought there was a giant clump of dirt in the road. And all of a sudden, I realized there's a turtle, swerved, stopped. And it was a cold, cold day. And he was going really slow. So I threw a towel over him and I grabbed him by the side because I have have no idea what to do with a turtle. So I threw a towel over him. I thought that might like disorient him somewhat so he wouldn't come after me. That's a no no. He'll bite you. Okay. Well, (laughs) I grabbed him by the by the sides from behind and I like scurried him over real fast. And I remember as I was scurrying him over real quick that like watching his arms start yeah. coming out of his shell and his head I, I remember it was it was like it was like seeing one of those old extendo things with the accordion and a punching bag or a punching like right. glove on the end of it you know because it was just it kept coming out and I was like this guy's not going to stop I, I thought he was coming out of his shell practically the whole body but I mean yeah, yeah they're long <laughs> yeah 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 actually to grab him by the tail is the safest That's, oh no kidding huh? yeah just grab him by the tail yep good to know so, good to know yeah glad I made it out <laughs> he had a big snapping turtle. I think he was probably about fifteen pounds. I See, he would have been me, going, he would have been going to hibernate. Yeah, if it was cold, he was he was going to his hiber- hibernation grounds. Okay, to bury for the winter. Got it. Oh, yeah, and you helped him yep. get there. Jim. Speaking of which, you mentioned they bury underwater for winter. Yep, they'll, they'll bury be underwater, so they do breathe underwater. They'll crawl up into a uh, a creek. They love creeks or warm water spring. And they'll bury down in the mud. I've dug them out as, as much as three feet in the mud under the water. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, but usually they're down a foot. And they'll, they love logs in the, the log jam that you can't even imagine. They'll get in. They'll, a 30-pound turtle will get in a log, and you'll go, how in the hell did he get in here? <laughs> It'll just blow your mind. And they'll stack on top of one. We've had as many as 75 in an old beaver one run once stacked on top of one another. What? Yeah, they were six feet thick, solid, just solid turtles. Just yeah. cordwood Hybrid, in there. Just cordwood. Unbelievable. But And they, they'll go in there, and, and they when, when they they usually hibernate about the third week in October, first part of November, 
when it's the first skim of ice, the first skim of ice. And then if it starts to get warm next week, they'll come out and they'll go come down, go out, come down. But when they actually hibernate December, January, February, it, they're, they're buried, they're done. And their heartbeat goes down to about three beats a minute. They're just barely alive. They're three just laying there. Three beats a yeah, minute. they're just barely alive. And they're just laying there. So it's 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 pretty cool. It's it's wow. really neat. What a biological wonder. Oh yeah, absolutely Seriously. it is. Yeah. Bowser's running around. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. But yeah, there's a lot of interesting a lot more interesting uh podcasts we need to do. Agreed. So, we'll have to come back for sure. Yep. Um and we'd love to hear we'd love to hear requests slash sh- slash suggestions. Should have said something that was easier to say. Uh, from those listeners out there, uh, what do you want to see? What do you want to hear more from Mike Valley? Check out again. I just can't like plug enough because it was super fun uh, shooting the video down here a couple weeks back as well. So check that out. Um, but yeah, Mike, thanks again. Hey, Mike, thank, thank you guys. You. We sure appreciate it. Yep. So th- alrighty, thanks everybody for listening. We'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.